Hey, if you brought a Bible, I hope you did, be finding 1 Peter. We're going to be in 1 Peter today. We're going to be in chapter 2, looking at verses 11 and 12. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. As you're turning there, I want to just take a second and voice another prayer. If you'd bow your head and we can pray together. Holy Spirit, would you meet us here? God, today as we approach this passage, I pray that we would be responsive to you. God, that we would be sensitive to your spirit and to your leadership. Lord, help me as I preach to reflect the, the character that you actually defined yourself with. In the Gospels, Jesus, when you said that you are gentle and lowly, Lord, I pray that as we present this text today, that I would be just that, gentle and lowly. Lord, help me to be kind and not contribute with this particular subject to the trail of blood that has been displayed and poured out by Many, many pastors who have fallen into the error of presenting difficult passages and difficult uh, discussions in a way that is contrary to your spirit. Father, I pray today that you would help me to exhibit godly, kind character as we present this passage. Give us responsive hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2 today, verses 11 and 12. I want to read those for you, and then we'll dive into a, an expository study of these couple of verses. The Bible says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Several years ago, um, a pastor, you've probably heard his name, Louis Giglio. Um, he, he has become a very uh, popular contemporary preacher, uh, preaching at a lot of different uh, events and, and venues and, and pastoring a church. Um, Louis Giglio made popular a uh, a concept that and, and well he he did this often he would um, and still does uh, do these presentations and these sermons where he he tries to tie in scientific evidence um, and and you know even in terms of space and and, and things like this and one of the uh, one of the sermons that he uh, that he did one time was about a uh, a microscopic biological attribute When, uh, when, when Paul writes that in, that in Christ all things hold together, and he pointed out that I want you to look at the shape of laminin is actually that of a cross. And so he, he had this big, <laughs> this big presentation about it, and I'm not knocking that necessarily. Um, it's a pretty interesting concept. But um, what, the reason I bring that up today is because I was thinking about that in relation to this passage, which is uh, heavily... Um, heavily laden with how we are to behave uh, in, in, in our relationship with the world. And that's actually where Peter is in this letter, is that he's diving into this concept. He's closed out his introduction at this point, and he's diving into a, a section of the, the letter that deals with how we as believers are to interact with the world. And the reason that it reminded me of laminin is because laminin is a microscopic cross. And, and there's no doubt about it. All of our lives, 
And, uh, and, and at the end of the day, no one would know that that cross is in our body unless they had a microscope to look at it. And this passage reminds me of Laminin because many of us as followers of Jesus want our relationship with Him to be just that, a microscopic relationship. When we come to Christ and we have a relationship with the Lord, uh, a saved person, there's no doubt about it. The cross of Jesus has made an imprint on their lives and, and upon who they are. But what we, we desire is that that cross would stay hidden away, that we could have some sort of, of private relationship with the Lord and neglect a public relationship with the Lord, that we could uh, be privately saved but not publicly saved. And that's just not a biblical concept of salvation. A person who is saved has a private walk with the Lord and a public walk with the Lord. There are no such things as microscopic Christians. And, and by the way, church, I believe Peter wants uh, these exiled and, and scattered believers to hear this. And I think the Holy Spirit of God wants us to hear this today. Th that the lost world should not need a microscope to find Jesus in our lives. They should not need a microscope to find Him. He says here in this passage, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners in exile to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. The first thing that we see if we are to, uh, to expand our walk with Christ so that it is not only public, uh, pu private but also public is that we need to work on our private lives. And that's exactly what, uh, where, where, where Peter starts here in this passage as he begins to tell us that we are to abstain from the passions of the flesh. So if you want to, um, to, to stop having a microscopic faith where the world doesn't need a microscope to see Jesus in you, the first thing that you need to do is to work on your private life, specifically and namely to abstain from fleshly passions. Let's look at this concept of fleshly passions. What is a fleshly passion? Your translation may actually say the word lusts there. Abstain from the lust of the flesh. And that is a great rendering of this word. He says, abstain from the fleshly passions or the, the lusts of the flesh. The fleshly passion is literally could be defined as an intense craving or desire. Uh, typically, what we, uh, what we apply to this definition, especially in our context um, today, is, is sexual lust. Okay? And, and now, by the way, listen to me when I, when I say this. Okay, over the years, uh, this, this passage has been interpreted in um, radically polar different ways, okay? Um, so, so for some people, uh, it, it has meant nothing more uh, than, than only, you know, cravings for money or for um, worldly things. But on the other end, uh, some people throughout the ages have taken this, this verse to essentially strip all sexuality from the Christian and say that, that even in marriage, somebody shouldn't have a sexual relationship with their spouse. And uh, honestly, I, th I think that today the church has a much better concept than probably it's ever had on this in that we understand that this verse is not saying to never engage in sexual behavior. This verse is not saying that human sexuality is bad. As a matter of fact, I think in the context of Scripture, this verse is saying that human sexuality is a good gift from God. But that it is such a good gift from God that we are to reserve it for a specific time period in life, and that is within the bonds of biblical marriage between a man and a woman in a lifelong covenant with each other. So he says that he's talking about these, these fleshly passions. But by the way, when he says fleshly passions here or lust, he's not only talking about uh, sexual lust. He's also talking about, uh, as, one, as one writer said it, uh, this is the concept of uncurbed, um, uncurbed emotion or uncurbed activity, uncurbed passion or desire. So he would say that a lust of the flesh could also be our lust after career, a lust after power, a lust after money. Hey, 
a lust after food and gluttony, a, a, a lust after ambitious behavior, a, a lust after social acceptance, right? wanting to, be, uh, to, to receive the approval of the world to such a degree that we'll put anything and everything above Jesus and above our relationship with Him if it gains us worldly approval. That's the sort of lust, that's the sort of fleshly passion that we're talking about here. And I want you to see what Peter says about it. He doesn't say to, to tiptoe on the line with it. He doesn't say uh, to, to get as close as you can to it, as a lot of people would say, is how close can I get to the line before it becomes sin? He's saying to abstain from it. The question is not how close can we get to sin. The question is how far from sin can we get? And so he says abstain from it. Literally, the word abstain in the Greek means uh, to keep away from, to avoid, or, or I like this, this terminology, to receive in full. Now you say, now that sounds a little bit contrary, right? To keep away from it or to receive it in full. It's kind of like this. When I was a, a, a young boy last week, I, uh, I, my, my dad, if, if I was acting up, okay, um, and my, my, if, 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 whether we were at the dinner table, if we were uh, at a job site meeting with a potential homeowner, uh, you know, who's going to buy a house from us or whatever it was, my dad didn't really have to say anything if I was getting out of line. He just did this thing. He, and, and you've seen this before, I'm sure. He just looked at me. Anybody else, they wouldn't even have had any idea. But there's a, there's a twinkle in his eye that says, I'm going to get a spanking, uh, you know, if, if I just keep it up. He just had to look at me. And you know what that look said? That look said this. Without saying any words, it said this. I've had enough. When Peter writes here that when it comes to our fleshly passions to receive it in full, he's saying you've had enough. He's saying if, if you have come to faith in Jesus and you've lived a life, no matter how many years it was, of worldly, fleshly passions, and at this point, you've had enough of those passions if you're a follower of Jesus. You've had enough of those desires and those cravings, those intense cravings that leave you empty and broken time and time again. He's saying enough of those things. You've had enough of that. You've had your fill of that. Now come and experience and taste of the goodness of God in His fullness every day. You've had enough. Keep away from it. So we're to abstain from fleshly passions. And the reason is because of a couple of things. Look at verse 11 at the very beginning of the, of the passage. The first half of the passage. verse. He says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. He describes these people in two ways. And this is the reason that they are to abstain from sexual uh, and, and lustly passions. And by the way, that's the same reason that we're to abstain as followers of Jesus from those same uh, fleshly passions is, is because we are a part, as sojourners, we are a part of a foreign nation. We're, we're, we're not from this world in which we live anymore. God has redeemed us and bought us out of it. And He has made us citizens of the kingdom of God. And so while we live here, and we're going to talk about what that looks like more in a minute, but while we live here, we're not from here. While you may have an American citizenship, you're not primarily a citizen of the United States. You're a citizen of the kingdom of God if you're a disciple of Jesus. And so you are a foreign citizen. And, and I remember in, in college, um, you know, I grew up in, in small town Oklahoma, um, I didn't have a lot of exposure to other other cultures, and certainly not uh, foreign cultures. And I remember when I went to uh, to, to college at Oklahoma State, um, making friends who were from all over the world. And one of the things that that I always noticed uh, when when somebody would come in as a foreigner into the United States is that they would bring uh, their own terminology, right? They would bring their own way of of clothing themselves. A lot of times they would even try to, to blend in, but, but, and, and they could maybe get close at times to, to our culture, but because they're not from here, they have a different understanding of fashion, a different understanding of, of values, a different understanding of terminology. And so even though sometimes they could get close, they couldn't quite fit the bill every time and in every area because they're not from here. Christian, if you're not from here, then you ought to have radically different values than the world. Our value system is different than that of God. And when we come to know Jesus, He imparts those values onto us. And it's not overnight, but it's gradually over time. 
One time George Whitfield uh, was asked after a, a revival meeting that he was preaching at in the 1700s, they asked him, how many salvations did you have today? And he said, I don't know, we'll see in about, in about six months. Right? Because those values, when a person is saved, those values are imparted to them. And we begin to have a new understanding of uh, um, abortion. We begin to have a new understanding about marriage, about sexuality, about how we handle our finances. We begin to, 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 to look more like the image of Christ that is talked about in Scripture. God changes our values because we are from a foreign nation as sojourners. But not only are we sojourners, we're also exiles. Look down at the text. He says, as sojourners and exiles abstain from the passions of the flesh. Well, what is an exile? <laughs> An exile is someone who is not from a country that he's living in, okay? And, and specifically, someone who is from another country but is living with and, and among the natives of that country. So, whenever I went to college, those people who came from foreign lands and landed here, they became, in a sense, um, exiles. They became, in a sense, they, they, were, they were living in and among and with the natives of the United States, people who were natively born here um, and, and are citizens of this country. Now, when Peter wrote this, he was writing, I want you to look back with me just for a minute to verse 1 of chapter 1. He wrote to a group of people scattered all over the place. And those people were eg elect exiles, look at this, of the dispersion in a few places, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, we could go through and we could look at every one of those places individually, uh, but, but let's just take one for example, Galatia. If you look at the history of Galatia and what was going on in their culture at that time, as he was writing to these Galatian believers, uh, Jewish believers, Gentile believers, all brought together in this one body called the church there in Galatia. Galatia had actually been annexed by the Roman Empire because they were working on a strategy, the emperor was make, was, had a strategy of exiling these communities and turning them into, uh, into headquarters for what he was calling the empirical cult. Okay? And what that meant was, Galatia, where these Christians lived, was a place that was, that was designed by the Roman government to be head, a headquarter, a, a place of worship to the emperor. So when he says, you, Christian, who worship the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone, are an exile in Galatia, you are living in and among residents who are sold out and bought in to worship of a human ruler. Think about the, con the, the, the contention that they must have felt within themselves. And in that culture... If you did not worship the emperor, by the way, and especially if you only worshipped one god and invalidated all of the other gods, you were seen as not only wrong, not only backward. Hey, you were seen as evil. Your views as a follower of Jesus in first century Galatia would have been seen as evil against the god and the gods of the land. Does that sound familiar to you? Hey, Christian, if it doesn't, you need to turn on the TV occasionally or look on your social media feed. If you are a follower of Jesus today and you hold to biblical uh, values, you're not just wrong. In, their culture, in our culture, you're not just backward. You are evil. And you are intolerant. And you are against the grain. And, and they dislike you. They hate your values. And I'd even go so far as to say that many people hate you because of the values that you hold. Because we are exiles, sojourners, living in a land that is not our own. Living in a land where we have values that are contrary to those around us. We must live differently if we are to abstain from fleshly passions. And why? Because it's a matter of the soul. Look down at the text. He says, abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Christian, you're to live differently, but Christian, you have to defend your soul. 
This is a matter of the very soul, not of our country, but of our churches, of our children, of ourselves. This is, the, this, is, this is a fight and a battle for the soul. He says the flesh wages war against the soul. And by the way, whose flesh? He's not talking about their flesh. He's not talking about the flesh of the world. He's talking about my flesh wages war against my soul. Your flesh wages war against your soul. There's an internal battle that is going on inside of the follower of Jesus because you have a sinful flesh at war with the Spirit of the living God dwelling inside of you. And constantly, God's Spirit is bending that, that, that fleshly desire and passion more into His image and more into His will. And there is a battle day by day, moment by moment, going on inside of you. And if you doubt it, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. When he says that, that the flesh wages war, hey, the literal rendering of that idea, wages war, is that the flesh marches against the soul. When I read that this week in my study, I just, that, that just gave all of this imagery. Now, I'm a big history buff. And, and I immediately thought of, of ancient warfare. And how uh, even up until the Revolutionary War period, the way that, that countries fought each other and the way that armies fought each other was just to line up against each other. They'd get lined up shoulder to shoulder. The opposing uh, enemy forces would line up shoulder to shoulder and they would march toward each other and they used to engage each other in hand-on-hand hand hand combat. But then uh, when, when the invention of the gun, they began to shoot at each other and they began to hurl cannons at each other. And, and, and that was the way that, that battles were fought. And by the way, whenever they had ground that group down to such a point that they would surrender and couldn't fight anymore, they would take them as prisoners of war. When Peter writes here, that the flesh marches against the soul. He's saying that the battle lines have been drawn. Your soul is standing here and standing and fighting for righteousness in your own life. But the enemy, the very sinful flesh of your body, is standing as the opposing enemy line. And I want you to hear something today. They are backed by the, the enemy of God, Satan. And your flesh, look at me today when I tell you this. I'm going to tell you in love. The flesh is hurling cannons of sinfulness at us. Cannons of pornography. Cannons of brokenness. Cannons of adultery. Cannons of the lust after power. They're, they're shooting and firing shells of artillery at us with the intent that, that, that we would fall into uh, premarital sex, that, that, that it would ruin our lives and give us baggage and, and hurt and, and, and pain that we're going to have to carry for years and, until God is, is, it just comes along and redeems it. He's firing shots at us daily. Until the point, look right here, until the point that those cannons of sexual temptation, those cannons of lustly, uh, lustful passion, grind us down to the point that our flesh is able to take us as prisoners of war. And, and, and listen to me when I tell you that the, the flesh, the world, the devil, they desire nothing more than to take followers of Jesus captive. In their lustly, or lustful, uh, fleshly passions and desires to take us captive to the point that, that we can't break free. But I, don't, I want you to see this though. He says to abstain. He's giving them, th th this, this carries the weight. It may not be written as a command in the Greek, but it carries the weight of a command. He's telling these believers to abstain. Listen, in the New Testament, the apostles didn't write things to people that the Holy Spirit of God did not empower them to do. So you say, I, I can't break free. In Jesus, you can. In Jesus, you can. You, you come and you, you lay your sin before the Lord and, and you bring your sin and your brokenness to a fellow believer that you can trust and you say, help me. I can't fight this on my own. 
I can't abstain on my own, but the body of Christ will bear your burdens with you and we will walk alongside you and we will help to deliver you from the, the sinful oppressor that is, that is holding you captive as a prisoner of war in this battle. It's urgent, church. It's urgent. If we are going to truly uh, live lives where the world doesn't need a microscope to see Jesus in us, it has to start with us as individuals deciding no more. You know what really changed the, the game in terms of ancient warfare lining up against each other? In the Revolutionary War period, George Washington was in a fight. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And he was losing, okay? And, and it, was, it was ugly. And so he used something that was actually another ancient tactic, but was just not agreed upon. People did not do what he did, but he engaged in what was called guerrilla warfare. They'd hide in the trees. They'd hide in the bushes. They'd hide in valleys. And, and they'd pop up and they'd attack these enemy lines who, who had no idea that they were even there. Hey, what, I, what I'm telling you in the, in the church today is that we as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, need to engage in some guerrilla warfare with our sin. It's, it's, this is not a time to say, well, that's not proper to talk about in church. It is the time to talk about it in church. You say, well, Brother Duncan, we don't need sex education in the pulpit. They're getting it in the classrooms. They're getting it in the locker rooms. They're getting it at the, at the, on the field. They're getting it at wherever they are. And, and, and they're getting it on TV, on social media. And we as the followers of Jesus are the only people on the planet who are qualified to talk about sexuality. And yet we keep our mouths shut about it. We're not going to be quiet about it anymore. There's no time for it. People are suffering. We have people... When one of a U.S. citizen gets taken captive by a foreign nation, we, we go crazy trying to get them back. And yet we have Christians in the church who are being held as prisoners of war to their flesh and, and we just pass by with a smile on our face and say, boy, I hope one day they'll figure it out. No more. No more. Why? Because if we don't, you know what? Well, actually, not only if we don't. If, we, if something doesn't change, we're going to continue down the path that we're already on. Tommy, you said it earlier. when You said we didn't used to have to talk about things like this at the Transgender uh, to Transformed conference that we're going to have Wednesday night. We didn't ha used to have to because that didn't even used to be a thing. The Bible says we invent new ways to sin. And if we don't, we're going to continue to see things like... That, I mean. This last week, you've seen it in the news. There's uproar. Finally. A male won a female national swimming championship this last week, folks. And you know, this, this last week I saw, I saw a headline that Pixar had taken out of one of their, one of their animated movies a, a homosexual kiss because they were afraid it was going to be too edgy. And then a lot of their staff got in an uproar about it, so they put it back in. Because, because Christian values are seen as evil in our culture. And so they, they put the, the same sex kiss back into an animated film for children. We've seen lust after sexual sin. We've seen lust after... The desires of the heart, which is deceitful above all things. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen lust after power. Where Vladimir Putin has literally invaded a neighboring country, a democratic nation, with their own rules and their own laws, a sovereign territory, and tried to take it over for himself. Lust after power on full display. And listen, I don't want you to hear that. If you're sitting out there today, or you're watching online, and you're, and you're saying, well, hey... I have those, those, uh, those same-sex attractions. I have that lust after power. I have that. But please don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that, that you are the problem. I'm saying that sin is our problem. Sin is our problem. You say, well, I, I've fallen into to premarital sexual relationship. I'm, I'm living an adulterous lifestyle. I'm viewing pornography. I'm, I'm cutting down my coworkers at, at work or at the office or, or whatever so that I can get the raise or the promotion. And, and listen, hey... Let's acknowledge right here and now that 
you're not the enemy. I'm not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. And he is using our flesh against us. Sin is the problem. Sin is the problem. And, and we in the church of Jesus Christ want to help you. When I've fallen into sin, and, and, and listen, I, I'm thankful that I had people to help me. When you fall into sin, I want you to know there are people who will help you. We're going to have an extended invitation time here in just a little bit. And, and, and listen, there will be people back there who want to pray for you, who want to answer your questions, who want to give you accountability, who want to serve you or help you get out of the situation that you've fallen into. Because if we don't, then, then at the end of the day, our lives are no different than the world around us. We're called to be so different that the world does not need a microscope to see Jesus in us. We're to radically, look, radically abstain from fleshly passions. That means fight tooth and nail to keep yourself from cheating when it comes to your business, financially or, or whatever. We, we're, to, we're to fight tooth and nail to make sure that our lives, our business dealings look different than the world. To say that, 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 that the way that we have fun as disciples of Jesus looks different than the world. That, that we don't engage in the same entertainment. That occasionally, as awkward and as weird as it f feels sometimes, that we have to say, no, we're not going to watch that movie in our household. No, we're not going to see that movie on the big screen. No, we're not going to watch that show because it has, it has uh, you know, one degree or another of pornography in it. It's bad for my heart. It's bad for my mind. It's bad for my eyes. And, and I'm not going to engage in that. And I'm not going to bring my family into an environment where they're going to engage in that and be damaged by it. deciding that, that we're going to live different and, and that's okay. We have different forms of fun, different forms of entertainment, that our marriages look different. We don't just live parallel lives where we're coexisting, but biblically we are, we are joining together as one flesh and, and it, seeing our hearts and our minds and our souls and our marriages intertwined with one another. That, that we're actually living in marriages and not just cohabitating together, two people who are unmarried, living uh, in, in the same household in a sexual relationship with one another, that we're not going to engage in that sort of activity because it's, even though it's different than the world, that, that even this, that when no one is looking, I want to make sure that my life when no one is looking, my completely, totally private life when there's no one around, when no eyes are on me, looks radically different than the world during their private life. Church, we're to abstain from fleshly passions. We're in a war for the soul. The soul of ourselves, our children, our wives, our husbands, our parents, our grandparents, our community, our church. We're in a war. Abstain from fleshly passions. He goes on. He says that not only should we have radically different private lives, but we should also have radically different public lives. He goes on, not only we abstain from fleshly passion, but we're also to maintain our Christian witness. Look down at the text. He says in verse 12, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. <laughs> Maintain your Christian witness. That word there, when, I want you to circle. If you write in your Bible in verse 12, circle the word uh, conduct. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. That word conduct is a theme that runs throughout this letter. One of the themes. It is a theme that runs throughout this letter because he's writing to these exiled believers and saying that your life, your conduct needs to be wholly different than the conduct of those around you. As a follower of Jesus, it will by, by, uh, by necessarily and by very nature be different than those around you. He says to keep your conduct how? Uh, honorable. Keep your conduct honorable. The word honorable literally means morally excellent. You want to know a good rule of thumb for this? And I can say this because I'm a pastor. Okay? Good rule of thumb for this is if something you're doing would scandalize you if you saw your pastor do it, don't do it. If you're going, I cannot believe... If, 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 if you looked at me and you saw me doing what you're doing, 
Would you kick me to the curb? And if the answer is yes, then follower of Jesus, can I tell you, and, and I try to stress this all the time, there's nothing different about me as a pastor than anybody else. But what I'm, I'm also going to say is there's nothing different about anybody else than me as a pastor. And so if something would scandalize you to see your pastor doing it, then don't do it. Or at least if, you, if you're bound up in it, get help to stop doing it. Get help to get out of the bondage. No longer be a prisoner of war. He says to keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. And when he says Gentiles, he's writing to these Christians because these Jewish Christians and these Gentile Christians have been brought together into a new body called the church. And so he's saying the Gentiles, everybody around you, all of the pagans living around you, all of the idol worshipers living around you, all of the, the, the atheists living around you, all of the, um, the no, uh, nominal Christians living around you, whatever. He's saying live differently than them. Keep your conduct honorable among them. In other words, Christian, we, we cannot engage in the same activities in which the world engages and expect them to say, boy, I want that Jesus. They don't need our Jesus if we live just like them. They don't want our Jesus if we live just like them. We're called to be radically different. And there are a couple of reasons he gives. I love this. He says, first of all, honorable conduct. Do you know what protects you? Honorable conduct protects you from slander. It does. Look down at the text. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that... The reason for this is so that when they speak against you as evildoers, when they accuse you of evil things, when they say they saw you or heard about this, about you doing this evil thing, they may see your good deeds. They'll be reminded of who you are and how you live your life. Not that you're always perfect, but that even when you sin, even when you fall into sin, you, you have an apology on your lips. That you have a repentance in your heart. That you're broken over your sin and you're desiring to follow after Jesus day in and day out. Prime example of this. I've got a, a, a man that I've, I've become pretty good friends with over the years. He's a district attorney. Um, and he, he, so, you know, district attorneys are in the public image and, and they always get, you know, cannons thrown at them, so to speak. Um, and, and I <laughs> was talking with a guy one day and he brings up this district attorney. And he starts accusing, not knowing that I am friends with the man, accusing the man of, of pocketing drug money as it comes into his district. And I looked at him and I said, hmm, sorry, brother, I know that district attorney and I know his heart and I know that he loves Jesus and I told the man you're dead wrong he would never do that why because he's kept his conduct honorable he has kept his conduct honorable privately yes but publicly also publicly people say well I don't care what they think about me that's not a biblical godly attitude it matters what people think about us. It really does. It, it really does matter what people think about us. We're to, we're to have a good reputation. Right? One of the qualifications for like a deacon or a pastor is to have a good reputation outside the church. It does matter what people think about us. And if we will keep our conduct honorable, no matter who's around, sometimes we get real holy around the church. But then we go down to the grocery store and and somebody comes up and they start, oh, they're griping and they're cussing and this. And, you, and we start thinking, well, I don't want them to feel bad. I'll jump in with them. <laughs> you know? Keep our conduct honorable. No matter who is around. It doesn't matter who's around. And if we'll do that, listen, when, and I love that. He doesn't say if, if they accuse you. He doesn't say on the off chance that somebody slanders your name. He says when. When. Okay? When they gossip about you. When they slander you. When they speak evil against you. When they, they, they condone, uh, condemn you. When it happens. 
He says, you'll be protected because people will know the way that you live your life and the values that you stand for and that those are godly biblical values and that you would never do the thing that they're accusing you of doing. Honorable conduct protects us from slander. Honorable conduct produces a harvest. Look at what he says. He says, so that when they hear, when they hear these things, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Listen, it's been said that we need to uh, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Okay, now listen, words are necessary. But sometimes, the only way to get the door open is to preach the gospel with our lives first. Words for the gospel are necessary. We have to preach about the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and second coming of Christ. We have to. There's, there's no way around that. But at the end of the day, some people will only come and start asking about the gospel or only engage in a gospel conversation with you when they see something different about you than themselves. Sometimes that is the only way that we can kick down a gospel conversation door is with honorable lives. And he says that on the day of visitation, some people will glorify God because of our behavior before them. Say, so what is the day of visitation? It used to be Monday nights when they'd go out and visit people. But th- listen, some of you, how do I get that and you don't? All right. Come on. All right. Listen, the day of visitation, two, two, uh, two ideas on this. One, the day of visitation could be the day of judgment. All right? Uh, could be the day of judgment. Could be the day that Christ visits someone's spiritual household and confronts them with their sin and invites them to be saved. Either way, he's saying that on that day, whether it's the day that Christ comes to them or the day they stand before the Lord, if they see Christ in us, enough that they ask about Jesus and we tell Christ to them and preach Christ to them, they might, just might, not every one of them, but some of them will glorify God, receive Him as Lord, receive Him as Savior, be saved and freed and forgiven of their sins, set free as prisoners of war to their baggage, all because we decided to follow after the Lord and be sensitive to His Spirit enough that we're not going to engage in the things that the world engages in. Can I tell you that someone else's eternal soul and their eternal home is worth us suffering a little bit on this side of heaven? It really is. Honorable conduct protects us from slander. Honorable conduct produces a harvest. And honorable conduct presents God with glory. At the end of the day, one of our chief responsibilities as follower of Jesus is to glorify God. So if you can't muster up any gumption or compassion for the people around you which I find that hard to believe but if you can't if you can't muster up any gumption to protect your name as a follower of Jesus and to protect the reputation of you and your family and the church then can I just ask you would it encourage you enough to say that honorable conduct living a right Godly life before the Lord. Not perfect, but consistent. Glorifies the God who died for you. It brings glory to His name. The world should not need a microscope to see Jesus in us. In 1992, uh, some NASA... um, NASA... Space experts were exploring the galaxy with their, and the, the universe with their uh, telescopes. And they came upon this, this galaxy that they'd already known about. It's the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's about 100 million light years away. Okay? And they came upon it with a, a, a more powerful telescope than they'd seen in the past, than they'd had in the past. And they saw something peculiar about it. See, they'd known about this, this, uh, <laughs> this galaxy for centuries. But they've never seen it in such detail. And one of the things that they noticed is that right at the center of that galaxy is a cross. I think I read that that cross is about 58 million light years.
100 million light years away. Surely, as followers of Jesus, the cross of Jesus Christ should shine through in our lives in such a way that people should see Jesus in us from a mile away. Surely, someone living uh, what they would call a cruciform life, someone who's living uh, daily to take up their cross and die to themselves and put Christ first over their passions, over their desires, over their cravings, over their flesh, over their hearts, and, and seek after Him will produce a harvest because people will see the cross shining through us. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I don't know. Uh, the Lord Jesus. I'll tell you something. They'll never see the cross shining through you because the cross has not made an imprint on your life yet. You need to put your faith in Jesus. You need to repent of sin. You need to seek Him and ask Him to save you and free you and forgive you and that you would no longer be a prisoner of war your own flesh and your own passions and desires. You say, I try to stop and I can't. That's because He wants to come and help you. He is the only key to right living. He is the only key to eternal salvation and eternal life. You may be in here today and you say, I feel like a prisoner of war, but I know I'm saved. Can I offer you help today? You come down here. I'll pray for you. Brother Tommy will be down here. He'll pray for you. Maybe during the extended invitation after we leave here today, you walk out those doors and you decide, I'm not going to turn right and do the same thing I've done Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday for weeks, months, or years with this burden and this brokenness and this sinfulness in my heart. But instead, I'm going to turn left. I'm going to go in here and ask somebody to pray for me and hold me accountable. We'll keep it confidential. We'll not go tell everybody. We won't put it on Twitter. We deleted our church's Twitter account for that. All right? We're not going to make it public. But if you need help today, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be just... Listen, if people are back there, don't assume it's sexual sin that they're dealing with. It may be the lust after power, the lust after money, the lust after career. The lust, I mean, fill in the blank. we got a whole host of lust, and we're making more every day. Don't assume what somebody's back there... Pray, getting prayer for. But if you need prayer, Christian, the only way that you'll live that kind of life where they'll see you from a mile away instead of needing a microscope to even figure out if you are a believer is if you decide today, I'm going to make my private life and my public life centered on Christ. Don't leave without knowing. Let me pray for you. As Brother Jesse comes forward, we're going to have a time of public come forward invitation and you just you follow as the Lord leads today let's pray Father it's in the name of Jesus that we come to you now and God it is not lost on me that a passage like this two verses long but so powerful and impactful and the very head on the nail that so many people are dealing with God, that, it, that that passage may have just left spiritual, holy carnage all over the room. And God, we praise you for that. I'm grateful when you pull sin out of a Christian's life and when you convict a lost person of sin and righteousness to be saved. I'm thankful. When you do that for me, God, I'm thankful. But Lord, I pray now that you would give them the gumption to act. That the conviction would not just lie there. And that they would go home and numb the conviction with more lustful, fleshly passion. But Lord, that they would act on the, on the conviction that you've put on their heart. That all of us would act on the conviction that we would bow our hearts before you and submit to you as the Lord of our life. And that we would glorify you by having honorable conduct. By living a life that screams Jesus Christ rather than just whispers about the cross. God, we put it in your hands. In Jesus' name. Amen.